Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for another Azure Data Academy session. Our series here is focusing on Azure Database for MySQL Flexible Server. I'm Brian Hitney, your Cloud Solution Architect host, and joined by our uh, SQL engineering team with Avnish and Jim. They will uh, introduce themselves in just a moment, but all of our content is on our Azure Data Academy page, which is aka.ms slash ADA. And of course, uh, feedback, we could take that directly in our repo at that previous link, or if you prefer, we have a Microsoft Office form, aka.ms slash ADA dash feedback. Today's session, infrastructure as code, deployment, Terraform, PowerShell, we're going to cover all of this and uh, how to use it, when to use it. And so I'm looking forward to today's conversation because uh, historically, you know, databases are, are, have been one of the most challenging things to transform into infrastructure as code. But before we, we dive right into that, one uh, quick thing we'd like to talk about is coming up in July is a session we'll be doing with the company that we have here today of Nish and Jim and myself. We'll be hosting a live roadmap and Q&A session. So we're gonna take a look at the upcoming release schedule for MySQL Flexible Server. We'll also take any questions that you may have and we'll hopefully provide some answers at the same time, we hope. And in addition, we'll do a quick recap of the sessions that we've already done. And uh, we're happy to dive into anything further. If you say, hey, back in that high availability session, you mentioned X, uh, could you give us some more information? So we're happy to do that. You can register at aka.ms slash MySQL Roadmap. That will take you to our event page where you can register for that. And I want just one quick comment is this session is intended for Microsoft partners that are under NDA agreements. So when registering, please be sure to use your company email address because we'll need to do that to verify uh, that you can attend. We will not be recording the session, so we look forward to having you there and and uh, and please be sure to to bookmark that time slot. All right, so moving on then to our main topic for today is infrastructure as code. And before I turn it over to Avnish and Jim, give you guys the opportunity to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about uh, today's session. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian. So this is Avnish. I have been with MySQL product team for past one year. Uh, I joined Microsoft uh, in September 2017. I spent a couple of years in SQL Server engineering team and now MySQL. Uh, prior to that, I was with Oracle for four years, and rest of my career has been in healthcare on the provider side. So really looking forward to this session. But before I start, Jim, I will let you introduce yourself as well. Hey, thank you, Avnish. Um, yes, my name is Jim Toland, and uh, I too am on the MySQL Growth PM team with Avnish, and um, I've been with the company for uh, quite a bit longer. I joined back in uh, 2000, and I've been with the CRM team, and I've been with this team now. I was I was with Microsoft Learning for a little while, and then I also have been with this team now for about five years. So looking forward to uh, to presenting this important information to you guys. Yeah, no, thank you. So as Brian mentioned that uh, today's session would be focused around uh, infrastructure as code and what are the different options we have in Azure or even in third party solutions. So before we do that, what is infrastructure as code and why it's so important for the customers, especially in the enterprise space? So infrastructure as code is one of the way to manage cloud resources uh, as, a, uh, as a software and it allows you to deploy the same environment in a consistent manner. So for example, if you have an application where you have multiple environments, let's say development, staging, test, and production, and you want to have the same experience every time you provision resources for that application. So doing this infrastructure as code would allow you to support that. And this also important if customers are pursuing uh, uh, DevOps uh, practices, because you can be, uh, deploy the uh, resources as part of your code deployment. And if tomorrow you are trying to make any change in the infrastructure, you can continue to do this as part of your DevOps uh, pipeline for continuous delivery. Now, Azure provides multiple options which you can leverage to do infrastructure as code. So we have Azure Resource Manager or ARM templates. We have PowerShell. Uh, Azure uh, CLI, and recently we also introduced Azure BICEP. And in addition to these other Azure native solutions, 
we also have the options to provision Azure resources using third-party solutions like Terraform, Ansible, Shap, Plumi, etc. And each of these solutions uh, support a different file format. So these formats could be YAML, JSON, XML, or HCL, which is for HashiCorp, the provider of the Terraform solution. So um, just briefly, we won't spend too much time in uh, deep dive into each of these options we have in uh, available in Azure. The focus would be uh, on the Terraform. So as I mentioned that in Azure, we have multiple options. Uh, so Azure PowerShell is one of the option, uh, which is an extension of Azure Windows PowerShell, which has been available in Microsoft for a long time. Azure PowerShell provides set of commandlets, which you can use to perform both cloud plane and data plane operations uh, using the REST API calls provided by Azure. And at the high level, whenever you provision a new resource in Azure, it goes to the control plane. And once resource is provisioned and you are trying to leverage the benefits or the features of that particular service, uh, then it goes through the data plane. And then you have the Azure CLI. So Azure CLI, uh, like Azure PowerShell, is uh, support multiple uh, operating systems. So it support both Windows, Mac OS, as well as Linux. The one distinction between um, PowerShell and CLI is that PowerShell, you can basically write your uh, code in PowerShell scripting. Versus in Azure CLI, you have to leverage different shell from the given operating system. So if you're planning to use Windows operating system, then you will be using uh, shell versus if you are using mac os or linux then you will use uh, bash scripting and then it comes to uh, arm or azure resource manager which is native to the azure uh, so every time we release a new service or new feature within azure then you would have the api calls immediately available whether it's a private preview public preview or ga and support for PowerShell or Power or CLI may or may or may not be available at the time of service release or feature release. It will definitely be available, but sometime it's not available as soon as we release the new feature or new service. And um, like any of these options, you can provision pretty much every single resource we have available in Azure. And you can use different tools to write the code. For ARM templates, we have support for Visual Studio. Visual Studio Code, or even Azure Portal. The code for ARM templates is uh, available through uh, JSON. Now, recently, we also introduced BICEP. And BICEP, you can think in a way, is a revision to ARM templates or ARM, Azure Resource Manager, because it provides the same core functionality and uh, same uh, runtime experience. And behind the scene, when you... Uh, compile uh, BICEP uh, code or files. It goes through the, it compiles into the JSON files and, and then it uh, sent to Azure for deployment. So it just provide you more, much, much better experience because BICEP, uh, BICEP code is very small compared to JSON file and it's easy to uh, understand. But uh, behind the scene, it gives you the same experience. So as we work with the customers, so one of the questions we hear from the customer that what does it make sense to, uh, or which solution would make sense to leverage for infrastructure as code? My response has been really it depends on organization cloud strategy. So if you are an organization who is pursuing multi-cloud strategy or planning to pursue multi-cloud strategy, then it makes sense to start with cloud agnostic tool, whether it's Terraform or something else. But if you are committed to Azure, Azure Cloud Provider, then it would make sense to leverage uh, Azure native solutions. And then it comes to which one would make sense to choose between uh, these options we have available in Azure, whether CLI, PowerShell, or uh, ARM templates, or uh, BICEP. Now it depends on the um, organization comfort level or skill sets. Some organizations are very comfortable with CLI or PowerShell, then they may prefer to use one of those options or ARM templates. 
The only distinction I would highlight again, as I mentioned in the beginning, that um, you would have support for uh, ARM templates as soon as we release a new service or new feature. And support for uh, PowerShell or CLI may or may, may or may not be available immediately. It will definitely come sooner, but uh, sometime we have seen a delay of month or couple of months. And similarly, for support for Terraform or other third party solutions, uh, it will come maybe six months later or um, de really depends on the demand. And as I mentioned that uh, Terraform is, uh, it's an open source and it really support hundreds of cloud providers, um, AWS, GCP, Alibaba, uh, VMware, Kubernetes, you name it and Terraform support would be there in majority of the cases. Both ARM templates as well as Terraform provide different methods uh, for variables, uh, declarations, uh, conditions, uh, and how to really write the code. Uh, very powerful. And uh, one thing I would also highlight is that, um, um, let's say um, you are initially committed to uh, Azure and you're using ARM um, templates. And later on, your dis organization decided to pursue multi-cloud strategy. Then switching from ARM templates to uh, Terraform requires a decent amount of effort. Obviously, it depends on how much effort you have, how many ARM templates you have to convert and the complexity of those efforts or, or, the, or, or these templates. But definitely, uh, it requires significant effort because the language is different and uh, how the variables or parameters are managed between these two uh, solutions is also different. So something to keep in mind. So um, rest of the presentation would be uh, focused around Terraform. We have um, multiple slides to cover Terraform and towards the end, uh, we will walk through uh, different Terraform fo forms we put together for this uh, presentation uh, to uh, provision multiple resources. So as I mentioned, Terraform is a open source uh, infrastructure as code uh, software provided by HashiCorp organization. It supports uh, multiple cloud providers. And at the high level, uh, it has two components. One is Terraform Core, which really provides the basic infrastructure. And then it relies on different providers to provide set of APIs, which you as a customer can use to provision resources within these cloud providers. Uh, it ha has a standard interface for creating resources by providing input and returning outputs as you provision different resources. And depending on the complexity of your uh, infrastructure as code or resources you are trying to provision, it provides an option to modularize your entire solution. And you can call these modules in a Terraform um, calls in Terraform to simplify the coding of these solutions. And um, at the high level, it has four phases. First phase is to uh, basically, obviously, you have to write the code uh, to provision different resources. Uh, and then you initialize the working directory in which you have all the Terraform configuration files to provision uh, or manage cloud resources. Then you do the plan. And you can think uh, Terraform plan as a dry run to validate your configuration files and identify which resource is a new resource which resource is an update versus which resource you are trying to delete or destroy. So it goes through the Terraform plan and then you finally apply the plan. And during the apply, it basically goes through all these configuration files to execute your provisioning. So as I mentioned, that Terraform has two important components. One is the Terraform core, and then you have the Terraform plugins, which are provided by different uh, cloud providers, so Azure, AWS, uh, each of uh, these cloud providers have set of plugins which Terraform expose to manage resources in these cloud providers. And you can uh, see the um, availability of these different cloud providers using this Terraform registry. So for example, you have this, uh, here is the Terraform registry, and as you can see, uh, we have AWS, Google Cloud Providers, Azure, Kubernetes, uh, Alibaba Cloud, Oracle, literally hundreds of cloud providers, so hundreds of providers um, collaborating with Terraform 
to export their solutions. And for each provider, you have to specify the um, provider uh, requirements and the configuration for the provider. So for example, here we have uh, Azure as, a, as an example. So in this case, HashiCorp slash Azure Resource Manager. Then you specify the version you want to use and the Terraform uh, CLI version. So that's the basic information you would be providing from the requirements perspective. And then you can specify provider specific information. So for example, in this case, I'm using this subscription ID. You can also specify uh, location and some other information. Alternatively, you can also have all this information uh, as local variables or input uh, parameters. And uh, once you do the Terraform in it, then it will create the dependency log file automatically. And I will show you some of the files created by these different uh, Terraform input or plan as you run the code. So like uh, every other language, Terraform also has the concept of input output variables as well as locals block. And each input variable is declared using variable block. So here is the example of one of the variable. So here we are um, uh, defining this resource group variable, uh, description of the variable, type of the variable. So in this case, we have uh, a string and the default value. You can also specify where the variable can have null or not and sensitivity that how sensitive this variable is, whether it's an input variable or output variable. And based on the sensitivity, so whether you specify, if you specify true, then it will uh, basically um, uh, encrypt the um, variable information. And then you can define the condition of the variable. So for example, in this case, I'm saying that uh, variable length must be greater than four. And first eight characters, of this variable should have that string. If this condition is not match, then it will display this error message. So it really allow you to validate your input parameters for the different variables. And once you have these variables defined, then you can reference those variables in your code using var as an object. Um, there are two options to uh, provide input for these variables. One, you can do it at, uh, at the time of Terraform apply. So in this case, you have this uh, variable name equal to variable value, uh, comma, other variables. Alternatively, you can also define these as environment variable. So tf underscore var and then the variable name and the value you are trying to set. So there are two options to set the variables. One is to provide this input uh, as part of the Terraform apply or define this as a environment variable. And then you have the output uh, block. And I have examples which I will share during the demo. And finally, locals block. To simplify the infrastructure as a code, you can have the uh, Terraform support the concept of modules. So for example, we have this uh, module server in which uh, you are provisioning uh, VM, IP, firewall rules, storage, etc. So you can really modularize your infrastructure as a code to simplify this. And um, we have different configuration files. Each file ends with uh, .tf extension. The standard for the variables, um, it, um, I'm using variables.tf, and then I have for the outputs. And other files uh, to be aware is, um, are like uh, terraform.tf uh, state. These files are created as you run terraform.init or terraform plan. So these files will be created and it's okay to run those files or run these uh, multiple times. So you can have Terraform in it multiple times. You can run Terraform plan multiple times. It won't cause, uh, call, it won't call, uh, it won't cause any problems. 
So in terms of the workflow, as I mentioned that uh, obviously uh, you will start to uh, authoring your uh, infrastructure as code. Once you have these Terraform configuration files, then you run uh, Terraform in it in the working directory you're trying to run the code. And then you can uh, do the plan to validate the uh, configuration files and also identify uh, this is all, uh, all part of the plan that um, which resources would be new resource and new resources would be indicated uh, with plus sign and if you're trying to uh, delete a resource those will be marked as uh, minus red sign so all that information would be available uh, when you do the terraform plan and you can either have Terraform plan output generated on the screen, or you can also save it as part of the plan file. And once you have the Terraform plan, then you can apply it to, um, to basically provision uh, different resources. So some of the common commands uh, you would see that uh, init, uh, validate, uh, plan, apply, and destroy. And other commands uh, you might uh, see is FM, FMT formatting graph. It uh, graph is basically to visually show you the relationship between different resources you are provisioning. And one thing I forgot, forgot to mention about Terraform, the Terraform is very good in identifying the dependency between different resources automatically. You don't have to specify the dependency as you are trying to provision uh, resources. So for example, if you are provisioning a VM in a virtual network, you don't have to specify that virtual network must be provisioned uh, before you provision the VM. Terraform is smart enough to provision the uh, virtual network first before provisioning the uh, uh, virtual, uh, before provisioning the compute resources. Because uh, our session is uh, all about Azure DB4 MySQL. Um, these are some of the Terraform calls which would which you can use to provision term Azure DB4 MySQL resources. So in our previous sessions, we talked about the deployment options for Azure DB4 MySQL. So we have single server, and these are some of the resources we are exposing. So you have Azure RM underscore MySQL underscore server to provision single server uh, instance. Then you have this um, MySQL underscore database to create the database uh, to manage the custom managed keys and so forth. Similarly, these are some of the resources which are available for flexible server, which is another deployment option. So Azure RM underscore MySQL underscore flexible underscore server to provision flexible server. Then similarly to create the database, which is same as single server and to manage the firewall rules. So these are some of the uh, configuration files I uh, put together for this demo. So I will walk through uh, each file uh, slowly, slowly. And if you have any questions, let me know. So I will start with the um, provider, which is one of the main configuration file. You will start for any cloud provider. So as I mentioned in the uh, in the presentation, um, you have this uh, resource provider block where you specify the provider. So in this case, we have this uh, Azure Resource Manager. Uh, if you are using AWS, then it would be something related to AWS. Then you specify the version. So in this case, we are saying that we want to use 2.65. So 65 represents uh, minor, uh, sorry, uh, uh, patch version. And then uh, two represent major minor version. And then you specify Terraform CLI version. And here you specify um, what are some of the uh, information or the configuration you want to use for a uh, for Azure. So subscription ID is this much here. Uh, it could be something else. Then I have this file uh, variables to define the different variables. So uh, resource group uh, underscore V is one of the variable to, uh, to, to, uh, to provision the resource group. Here is the default value. I'm saying uh, 
it cannot be null sensitivity uh, is false and then condition and error message similarly this is for uh, region so my default value is east us and it cannot be null so you can uh, define all these different variables and here is an example for locals block so common tax is one common tax is one of the local block when you use this in your con configuration file it will basically create three tags for a given resource you are provisioning. So what I'm saying, owner is Azure MySQL engineering. So that's one of the tags it will uh, create for that resource. It will also create a uh, name tag uh, with this va value. And finally, environment. Another uh, configuration file here I have is the output. So for each resource, you can identify what the output you want to generate. So for example, for a resource group, it will provide the uh, resource group ID. Uh, for the location, it will provide this location output. And similarly for tax and uh, other uh, output uh, variables. So um, once you have these uh, basic configuration files, then you can provision different resources. So for example, if you are trying to provision uh, network resources, this particular block uh, will create, will provision a Terra net, uh, Terra underscore V, uh, Terra dash V net uh, virtual network. Here is the address space range. And resource group, I'm basically using the variable I provisioned or I defined in the beginning and same is uh, true for the location. Now here I'm saying that it depends on the resource group. So as I mentioned that uh, you don't have to specify the dependency, but uh, just for the example, I'm using this here as well. So I'm saying that it will depends on the resource group. So resource group must provision first before you provision the virtual network. Then once your network is provisioned, then you can provision subnet. So resource group name, network name, um, prefixes for the address space for the subnet, and service endpoint. And this is for the delegation. So few Azure service, including Azure DB for MySQL flexible server, requires delegated subnet. So in this case, you can use this blog block to say that, okay, this subnet is delegated for the uh, flexible server. And uh, this particular piece of code is to provi uh, provision the private uh, DNS, uh, which is the requirement for flexible server. If you are provisioning that resource in your private, uh, in your VNet, and then you specify the network links. Another example I have, uh, or the configuration file I have, is for the storage provisioning. So you specify the uh, 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 different variables, the network rules, tag, and then um, this is uh, for the log analytics workspace. So if you're trying to do the log analytics for a particular um, um, resource, this is the code you can use to provision the log analytics workspace. And then I have a couple of examples to provision uh, single server and flexible server. So um, this is to provision the single server. Again, this is the name of the uh, resource it will provision for the single server. Then location I'm basically getting from the input variable. Same is true for the resource group. And uh, I'm hard coding the login name and password. You can certainly have these as input parameters as well. And you can define the, uh, those parameters as sensitive uh, parameters so that uh, the value you provide is masked um, during the display. Then you can specify the SKU name, the storage you're allocating, the backup, uh, backup retention days, and whether uh, it's a geo redundant or not. And auto grow storage. Uh, by default, it's uh, true. You can identify uh, 
whether encryption is enabled or not. Uh, SSL enforcement. And you can also specify these timeouts. So for example, for um, any region, if resource provisioning is taking more than uh, 60 minutes, uh, then it will automatically time out, rather keep on trying. And you can also um, define the delete uh, um, timeout. So there are different uh, timeouts you can specify. Then in this case, I'm using this uh, tag. So it will basically create this tag for this resource. And these are the uh, firewall rules. And once uh, this one is provisioned successfully, then it will create this database name uh, database within this single server instance. Similarly, for flexible server, uh, similarly you specify all the variables. So SQ name, zone. So flexible server, you can specify the zone where you want to provision your flexible server instance. Um, and since it is provisioned in the VNet, you specify the dedicated subnet, uh, private DNS, which we provision within the network configuration file, uh, storage, you can specify the maintenance window. So day of the week, start hour, start minute. And then you can also specify, so in this case, uh, I'm using this uh, um, high availability option as a variable. So uh, during the apply, you can specify whether you want to provision flexible server with HA configuration or known HA. And based on the input parameter or input value, it will take appropriate actions. Again, you can specify the timeout settings. Um, these are for the firewall rules, uh, database creation, Again, dependency is not required, but for the example, I'm using this. And um, you can also provision the read replica uh, using the Terraform. So in this case, uh, I'm saying that it depends on this uh, flexible server instance, which is the primary instance. And then um, you specify the um, name of the read replica the resource group name, location, and the create mode you have to specify as replica to indicate that this particular resource should be provisioned at the read replica based on this primary instance, your, uh, based on this um, uh, resource group ID of the source um, or, or the source server ID. I think I walked through all the, uh, so I mentioned that when you run the Terraform, um, um, uh, Terraform plan, it will generate this uh, Terraform state. And this is the log file I mentioned. So when you run the Terraform in it, in it uh, first time, it will please create this uh, log file. The way to run this code uh, is that uh, I have this um, command line prompt and I'm in this uh, directory where I have all the Terraform configuration file. So first step would be to uh, run the Terraform in it. And in this case, because I already ran this before, it says the Terraform initialized in an empty directory and directory has no Terraform configuration file. You may begin, you may, uh, begin working with Terraform immediately. Then second step would be to do the Terraform plan. My apologies, I'm in the wrong directory. Let me switch to the um, right. So let's run this again. So Terraform um, init. So it's going through the initialization and initial, initial, initialization completed successfully. Let's do the Terraform plan. So it takes some time uh, to uh, do the Terraform plan run, but uh, soon it will uh, start generating the output. So while this is happening behind the scenes, maybe this would be a good time to ask, those coming from PowerShell you know, are, are likely used to desired state configuration or DSC just to help streamline. Is that what that state file is the equivalent of in Terraform? Yes. So what Terraform does is that it validates the uh, configuration files you have in that working directory. 
and then it identify which resource is a new resource or such which one requires update and which one uh, will be destroyed so um if you look at this plan so you can see these different signs uh, so plus sign plus sign uh, so in this case uh, all these uh, which have the plus sign means all these resources will be provisioned whether say uh, reprovisioning of the same resource or your provisioning is first time but let's say um, if you have uh, provisioned a uh, vm with 4v core using the terraform configuration files and later on you change the configuration of that vm from 4v core to 8v core then this plan will indicate that you okay you are scaling up this vm from 4v core to 8v core or for any reason if you de uh, decide to delete that vm then it will show as a minus um, and the resource name to uh, indicate that resource will be deleted as part of this uh, configuration um, so unfortunately i don't have anything on the delete side so i'm just provisioning these resources but you can think uh, terraform plan as a dry run to make sure that everything has been uh, configured or provisioned um, everything has been planned successfully before you do the apply, uh, apply. and final step would be to do the apply apply and then it will start provisioning different resources so it will take some time if i run this um, to provision all the resources but um, that's the way terraform works that's that's great and so it seems like then the plan can be very useful at uh, even just detecting differences between environments if you're trying to troubleshoot an issue and you don't know exactly where something may have gone wrong at some point and you just know you need to compare you can run that against that environment just to just to see how it analyzes and what what the differences are Absolutely, uh, I think this is one of the um, a nice feature Terraform really provides, not only to validate the configuration files, but also to make sure that uh, it gives you a complete visibility to indicate that which resources it's going to pro provision versus which uh, it's going to destroy or update. So that's all I had uh, for this session, Brian. Uh, we can go through any questions uh, you or Jim might have. I'm curious at we... how... Yeah, no, this is this is great. This is really useful. Uh, I have not used Terraform, so I appreciate getting this uh, this insight. How about guidance for those who, uh, well, they, they either might be new to this completely, or they might be coming from, say, just using PowerShell or another tool, trying to decide between, do I use Bicep, for example? Is that considered the new tool? Do I decide to migrate to Terraform? And one of the takeaways that I've gotten out of seeing your demo and, and, and the points you've made during the presentation is it seems like the biggest concerns are really around support for multiple cloud environments and then feature latency, right, for things to, to be integrated. Would you say that those are the two biggest ones? Uh, are there any other considerations? No, I think these are the uh, two bigger ones. So as I mentioned in the beginning that uh, if your organization is pursuing or planning to pursue multi-cloud strategy, then it makes sense to um, to leverage cloud agnostic tool. That being said, we should keep in mind that the API for the, uh, for a service in Azure may take some time before it's available in a, a Terraform. It could be three months, six months, really depends on the demands from the market. Now, uh, if you're committed to Azure, then um, we really have three options now, PowerShell, uh, CLI, and BICEP. But as I mentioned, BICEP is the revision to uh, ARM templates. So I would suggest to start with BICEP. There is no point to start with the ARM templates now. If you are starting new, just go with BICEP. But uh, between uh, BICEP, PowerShell, and CLI, I would say it really depends on the comfort level or your skill sets. Uh, if you're comfortable with PowerShell or CLI, then you may decide to stick with those options because uh, you have been using these tools um, for a while. Only thing to keep in mind is that um, there is a slight latency in having the uh, CLI or PowerShell availability for different features or services we have in Azure. It could be a month, couple of months, or but not a lot. Great, thank you. I don't have any other questions. I'm not sure if Jim does. I think that might wrap us up. 
Yeah, I basically was going to ask some of the same questions you did. I thought there was a great, great information presented, but just kind of looking for like the best practices type things. And I think that uh, that y'all covered that nicely. So great information. Great. Thank you, Avnish. Um, and thank you, Jim. Why don't we talk for a moment about the uh, upcoming session in July on the roadmap? Oh, there we go. Thank you. We're going to have you two back on uh, on July 14th, 1 o'clock Eastern time. We're going to be doing the live roadmap and Q&A session. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I hope all of my, our partners are as well, because one of the most frequent questions that I get as a CSA working with partners is understanding the roadmap and when features are coming and uh, to have a line directly into you two to discuss that I think is fantastic. So we're looking forward to having that uh, coming up in July. We'll also take any questions that you might have because we are going to be live. So if you have any other questions on topics that we have previously covered, feel free to bring those. And uh, obviously any questions that come up during the presentation on the roadmap, feel free to bring that as well. I do recommend that you register early using your company's email address because the session is open to Microsoft partners who are under uh, NDA. We'll be discussing the roadmap and we won't be recording the session, so you will not be able to go back, unfortunately, and view it afterwards like you typically can with many of our uh, presentations. So we will have to see you there live in order to give you the presentation. But Hope you're able to join us and we look forward to having you register. Uh, you can check it out at aka.ms slash MySQL Roadmap. And um, in, the, in the meantime, Avnish and, and Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to go over all of this information. And I really look forward to talking with you uh, in the Roadmap session. And you know, Thank Great. you, Brian. Yes, thank you very much, Brian, uh, for pulling this together. Sure. Take care, everybody.